Well, welcome everyone. I'm Steve Carver talking to you from my home office and uh, studio in Dunn, North Carolina. Uh, this is my presentation number 1053, and I'm so glad to have you on board with my uh, journey into entrepreneurship. Uh, my journey is on the way pretty good into it now for 60, uh, 63 years. I do want to tell you I'm not a lawyer or an accountant. Uh, I am a person that's been in business for a lot of years and a lot of businesses, and glad to tell you I'm still in business today. Uh, we're had a, really having a great day today selling, I sell uh, equipment that goes behind tractors, implements like mowers and cedars and things like that to uh, have a nationwide customer base. <clears throat> so we're doing business every day and uh, keeping the, trying to keep the doors open just like every other entrepreneur does. We're so lucky to be sponsored this afternoon by the Small Business Center at Lenore Community College, <clears throat> located in Keston, right downtown, and our host is Greg Hannibal, who just spoke to us a minute ago. He'd love to hear from you if you're in that general region for uh, set up an appointment, talk about how your business is coming along or how he might help you move it to the next step. You will get the best advice from the directors like Greg uh, from your small business centers. There's no charge, expert advice, everything's confidential. So if you're not in the uh, Canston uh, region and would like to know who the closest small business center is to you and the director, just let me know. Just drop me an email or write it in the chat and I'll get you hooked up with the uh, person closest to you that can give you a hand. Greg's a great fella. He'll look forward to seeing you. Here's his phone number if you want to write it down and, uh, and send him a message. He, re he asked uh, one thing of us. Uh, when he sends you the email evaluation for this afternoon's program, please don't ignore it. Please fill it out, the information, and send it right on back to him. Uh, that way he can uh, better uh, gauge uh, the progress we're making with our teaching, and you'll also have a chance to uh, tell him how we might improve our program. So uh, please uh, answer up real quickly to uh, his evaluation. Uh, three study guides are available to you. Uh, he has probably already emailed them to you. If you didn't get your email with the study guides related to this afternoon's topic, I'll be glad to uh, email it to you again. Just uh, give me your information in the chat and I'll send it to you. There's three different uh, uh, files. One that covers all the talking points we're going to talk about today. The other uh, talks about appreciation. And the last one is just a, a, a checkoff list for tax prep. Just some handy tools for you. My job is to be assertive. My job is to help motivate you. My job is to encourage you to take that first step or the next step to get further down the road towards your goals. So uh, I'll say you ought to do this and we need to do that and such as that. And I know how uh, people get tired of hearing those words. But you know, that's what we're here for today. And a lot of times uh, that one extra little push will help make things go along. Get an entrepreneurship, especially most of us doing it right by ourselves, is not an easy job, and I know that. Uh, again, in the chat board, please give me your uh, name, hometown, and email address, and we'll be uh, better uh, able to serve you in the future. Excuse me, Steve, we only got the, I only had the two. I did not have the checklist. All right, well, I'll be glad to send that on to them. Uh, that'll be fine. I'll All send right. you a copy of it, too. Thank you. Thanks, All right. Uh, we've got a busy uh, 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 summer ahead of us. Uh, lots of times in summer, there's very little things to uh, get studying, but I've got a reasonably full schedule to, uh, on your <clears throat> slide now, things we'll be talking about. And I'd like to invite you to uh, visit future programs uh, with me and with uh, all the other speakers that you have time for. <clears throat> if you'd like more information on how to pre-register for these, just let me know and I'll be glad to send it right on to you. Part one this afternoon is about record keeping. Uh, uh, you, the foundation for filing taxes and, and uh, getting your affairs in order all starts with record keeping and of course 50 years ago when the computers came out and people said we're not going to have paperwork anymore. Well, that sure certainly didn't work out because I'm looking at my desk right here and I can assure you it is stacked high with papers. 
and uh, and always is. So there's a lot of records to keep. The key, if you're just getting started in business, however, is to make sure that you keep your records to the place you can find them, because you're going to need to refer back to whatever you're doing. So if you're early in business and you haven't gotten started yet, go ahead and get a filing cabinet. Go ahead and get some dividers in it and know that you're going to have some paperwork to keep up with. Go ahead and get you some flash drives that you can save computer files. They're going to be very, very uh, needed uh, to do that. Uh, and and uh, get a system that you can do it. I want to tell you that if you don't have a, an aggressive business where you're making some good money and serving a lot of customers, uh, the telephone is going to be very handy. But I'm going to tell you that you cannot run a, a, a sustainable business uh, for more than a month or two on your telephone. You're going to need a PC or a laptop uh, where you can keep up with your files, <clears throat> manage your marketing, manage your invoices and your books. So just know part of what you're going to need when you actually start your business and get out there running is a uh, PC or a uh, laptop to help you with your systems. Some records we've got to keep forever. Some records we've got to keep for seven or eight years. Uh, in addition to other things personal that you may want to keep. So make sure that you understand how the flash drives work. Maybe you want to keep your records and storage off, uh, off site with software. There, there are companies that uh, will do that for you. That will download your computer every night to keep, help you keep up with your records. Uh, and you want to be aware of paper storage, uh, what type of location you're using to put those papers in. Uh, entrepreneurs sometimes get in trouble by keeping your, uh, your, your, your files and your paperwork in cardboard boxes and putting it in the garage. Uh, and then moisture uh, uh, gets into your boxes out there if it's on a cement floor or maybe you have a flood issue or a rain coming in. So you want to you think about these records are very important. And there'll be a time when you're re really happy that you uh, have done a good, good job keeping up with them. So know that keeping those records are important. Some you have to keep forever. Some you want to keep forever. Uh, and they're listed here on the slides. Your, your corporation documents, uh, audit reports through the years. If you're into copyrights or patents, of course, those are very important paperwork. Uh, Stocks and bonds, you need to keep up with those as well as uh, deeds and mortgages. If you're starting to accumulate a number of these and, and, and you see it in the future, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and get a safety deposit box at the bank uh, for these very special documents so that you'll know where to find them. And in the case of your untimely demise, uh, someone else would be able to, to, uh, to find them as well. So safety deposit box is always a good idea for the items that you don't have to go to often, the permanent type records. Of course, you don't need that local filing cabinet in your computer with the things that you need to use on a regular basis. Now, some things you do need to keep permanently, and that includes tax returns and the related documents to that. Uh, you just don't ever know when you don't have to pull information out or such as that. We are lucky this afternoon to have a banker on board with us, and that's so good and so special. Uh, he's the fellow you see on your list named Corey. Corey, thank you for joining us. It's always good to have an uh, expert. So if I uh, leave something out or you can think of something that's really important that you'd like to add to the program, uh, raise your hand or break in and, and let me know. We'd love to have any uh, input that you would like to, to play, as well as from any others that, uh, that uh, see something that's important that we need to add. Seven years is the big number next. If you're not keeping it per permanently, there's a few items that you need to keep for seven years. Now that's the law, but I want to tell you, I like to go ahead and do it for eight years because I'm always putting something in a box late. I close my boxes out, close my year out, seal up the box, and then something else will always float in in a month or two. And it's my human nature just to put that in my current file. So if I need it, I'll find it in this box. So I, I do keep items uh, for eight years instead of seven. But you want to keep certain records that are so important to you that you might be digging into those boxes more often than you think. 
Uh, entrepreneurs very seldom are, are aware of the fact that you're going to need to keep your shipping documents, your what's called a bill of lading. A bill of lading uh, is that document that uh, tells you uh, when you get something uh, that's been shipped to you, the shipper, when it was shipped, the date, and such as that, and where it went to. In today's world, a lot of us are doing business out of state. And a lot of times when we do business out of state, there are certain items that we do not have to charge North Carolina sales tax on. And, and if you've got a bill, of, a bill of lading or a shipping document that certifies that that uh, sale was actually uh, shipped out of state, uh, you'll need that if you have a North Carolina sales tax audit. So keep up with those. If you don't have it, then you're going to be liable to pay the taxes that you didn't think you had to. So that's very important. Another important document, are, of course, are your employee records. Uh, it, and if you're just getting started, you want to save your personal records, too. But for your employees that you hire, you want to keep those documents for at least seven years. And I, I kept mine even longer than that. Because you just don't ever know when someone may have a medical issue and have an interest in maybe saying that they were hurt on the job when they were working for you. Uh, and if that's the case, that means that, that your workman's compensa compensation uh, uh, budget and, uh, and file will be taxed to pay those damages. Maybe indeed they didn't remember right or just it wasn't a fact that they were employed when they were working for you. If you have those records, you'll be able to document and prove that so it could become very, very valuable for you. You want to keep up with other uh, records related to the handling money, which of course would include bank statements and uh, uh, records, cash registers, contracts and leases and such as that. Your sales tax returns, you would definitely keep those in an important file, as well as your invoices. Now maybe you haven't got started yet, you will have Every time you do a transaction, you will generate an invoice. And that invoice will have a numerical number on it, and of course it'll be dated. And uh, whether you're doing it in a computer file or actually had the paper here, or both, like most small businesses just getting started, keep a paper record and a computer record. And those need to be kept for at least seven years. Good idea to keep them in numerical order and such as that, so that when you go looking for them, you can find them. And you will be amazed how often your customers will need to see an old invoice or need to get some information from it. Uh, uh, I haven't had a storefront business uh, in a long time, but I'm, I still get at least once a month and sometimes several times a month a customer from 10, 15 years, 30 years back sometimes asking about a serial number or a value on the tracker for one reason or another. Uh, Folks, when their, when their parents pass away, they have to dig up old information to <clears throat> create values. And so if you're able to find those old invoices, it really helps you. So I really kept, I keep them uh, pretty much in a permanent file as well. Takes up a lot of space, but uh, it's worth it when you need to have that, those records come to you. You know, in North Carolina, we are subject to some rough weather sometimes. Uh, Hurricanes and floods and tornadoes, not too bad, but we do have our share of hurricanes and the floods that result from that. When that happens in, an, in your area, the federal government may declare it to be a federal disaster area. And when that happens, FEMA can come in and offer small businesses and other folks uh, uh, grants or low interest loans or such as that for the money that you've lost uh, uh, in, in, a, uh, in a disaster, uh, flood or hurricane. But they're going to need to see your records to justify any uh, payments to you. So remember that when you're putting your records up, those that you think that you might need, like insurance information or proof of profit and loss, your, your financial statements, you might want to actually put those in a in a separate box uh, labeled a uh, uh, need for disaster or in case of FEMA, especially you folks that are down close to the coast are uh, more likely to, to have that issues than uh, uh, some of us up here on the west side of 95. But those records will be absolutely imperative if we have that issue to come up. 
Now we're going to move into actually thinking about, uh, about the different types of expenses because in taxes, we pay less taxes when we have more expenses. Well, let's say that again. We pay less taxes when we have ex more expenses that are deductible. In other words, when I say deductible, I'm referring to the amount of money which is exposed to, to be applied to taxes, our tax exposure, subject to being taxed. And in, in generally in business, uh, we are taxed on our profits. After we take the money that comes in and subtracts the money that goes out, what's left is our tax exposure. And then we look at that tax exposure and can whittle it down with certain types of deductions. And that's pretty much the thrust of my presentation this afternoon. Mr. Hannibal and I talked uh, several months ago about this presentation and, and different things that he, he uh, uh, hears his clients asking about. So I have redone this today. Maybe some of you have visited uh, these presentations with me in the past. But today, this is a brand new presentation where I'm really trying to focus on depreciation and the different types of deductions that a small business entrepreneur uh, would be interested in applying. So that's, that's the, uh, the basis for our, our uh, topic and thread this afternoon. There's two types of expenses. We're just going to call one of them general business expenses, the things that you buy and, and use up in the normal course of running your business. Uh, uh, and, and there's lots of different things, uh, like you have to rent sometimes, uh, we have to travel sometimes, we have to pay employees, and all of these are, are, are business expenses. Uh, we're not creating any assets when we're uh, paying this money out. We're just basically paying for things that we use up, that we have to do, and there's, there's no tangible uh, hard evidence of it left after we buy these things. I use those terms because on another type of uh, expense that will be the case, but all this, every time we pay rent, anytime we have a business travel or we pay our employees, those are general business expenses and now for the first time I'll use this word, write-off. A write-off means we're, we're, we're taking away some money from our, our uh, tax exposure total. So these would all be first class write-offs. The other type of expense we'll call a capital expense. You may have heard of this before, maybe not, but a capital expense are those items that we buy that become assets. Capital expenses are those items that we buy that become an asset. In other words, it's tangible. We can touch it, it's real. We can go back and show someone that we've got it. Uh, if we're are depreciating it, it's the first time I'm using that word, capital expenses are depreciated, and sometimes if we're audited uh, to show what our book value is and where our assets are, you'd be able to actually point to this item and tell them the date you purchased it, how much it cost, and how much it was worth then, and also now, a number of years later, how much it's worth now. So capital expenses are a whole different group and bring in a lot more conversation to what, what we're talking about. Capital expenses are those items that generally cost more money, generally are going to last us at least a year. Uh, generally, uh, there uh, are tools, uh, automobiles, uh, real estate, tangible items that we do. Now, they are going to be applied to uh, the, the uh, umbrella to come under depreciation, those, those capital expenses. So let's move right into that. Understanding depreciation, which is not an easy thing to do uh, unless you've had so, uh, some experience or work with it, and it gets more complicated each time your business grows or expands or your list of assets grows, but understanding depreciation is an important thing to do. One of your study guides is titled Understand Depreciation. And I searched the internet for an article uh, 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 back uh, last year uh, for an article that I could share with y'all that pretty much goes into some depth, a lot deeper than I have time to or, or, or know about 
uh, to share with you if you want to dig into depreciation, get a better understanding of it, please take time to read this article by Lisa Borga. It's excellent. It helps any entrepreneur get a real good understanding on the uh, a better understanding about how depreciation works and how it might work for you. So that's why that's why I've shared that with you. Now we're going to take it down and kind of do the basics this afternoon. So let's let's focus on depreciation now. What is it? It's a reduction in the value of an asset as time goes by. That asset that we purchase has a reduction in its value as it is worn out and used. So we're interested in keeping up with how much we paid for it, number one, and then keep up with how it's depreciating, how it's depreciating, how it's losing value as it gets older. Because it is an asset, and we're going to enter it onto our books you know, in the depreciation sheet, and it will become part of our book value, or when we buy an asset, the value of our business goes up according to how many assets we buy. You with me so far? But we have to be fair to ourselves and the taxing folks by keeping up with how much that asset is worth as it starts wearing out year by year. Why is that? Because we're going to be able to use that expense when we buy something to number one, improve the value of our company, but number two, through depreciation, we're not going to have to pay as much taxes because we did invest in our company. We're going to be able to write off, we're going to be able to write off a portion of our tax bill depending on how much we're investing in our company. That's the way the tax folks who set up the government and the tax records, that's one thing they do to help entrepreneurs get businesses started. It's something they do to help businesses that have been established a long time to spread their tax payments out over a longer period of time and encourages us to buy more machinery, to buy more automobiles, to do this and to do that because we're getting a depreciation tax break. Now, several times this afternoon, and this will be the first, I'm going to give you caution. Some folks getting started have heard this message so much from people trying to sell you something that you get a, you, you might have a sense that, hey, if I'm making money, all I've got to do is buy more stuff. All I've got to do is buy more stuff. Excuse me. And, and, uh, and when I do that, I'll save money on my taxes. Well, that may be true. <laughs> but it may not be true, and therefore, before you make that important decision, you should talk with your tax advisor who understands all that's going on and what the laws have changed from this year to next year or year before because they are always changing with uh, how often and the way that you would go about using depreciation. But generally, let's talk about this. You just started your company and you've got $10,000 in your bank. So, okay, your, your business is worth $10,000. That's easy. You got it right there. But you need to buy a saw. You need to buy something and it's worth $5,000. So what we're dealing with is when you take that money out of your bank account, that liquid cash, and you purchase something, well, your company was worth uh, – $10,000, but now you've taken $5,000 out of the bank and bought a saw, does that mean that your uh, company worth went down $5,000? Did it increase? And the answer is no, because you turned the cash into an asset, into a tangible asset. You got $5,000 of value in, the, in, in your company still, and uh, now you've also got a $5,000 value in that saw. So as we're seeing on the slide here, now you, you are still are maintaining a $10,000 value on that first day. But now you know that anytime you buy something, the, the meter starts running right then. So the value of that salt is going to be going down because it's used and being used. So your company net worth on one day is 10000 but the next year it will start depreciating uh, as that salt appreciates. 
Notice on the slide now that the way we do this, you're able to take depreciation values as write-offs over a five-year or six-year or seven-year period. Sometimes you can take it all off on one year. That's something you and your uh, tax advisor have to talk about, depending on what the current laws are. But let's say that you set it up on a five-year write-off plan, which is generally the way folks uh, do things. So if we're going to write this off over a period of five years, uh, the first year that is going to be on the books at $5,000. But see in the slide how it goes down each year, $1,000, brings it to $4,000 the second year, $3,000 the third year, and so forth. So at six years, with a five-year write-off plan, that saw, even though you still own it, is going to be on the books at zero. You'll be on the books at zero. So on your books, you would show one saw, how much you paid for it, what's the book value, Zippo. This is the first time, but I'll say it again. That's why you have to be real careful about considering what the book value of a company is. So this is based on these depreciation numbers versus what the fair market value is because this is based on real numbers on what things would actually buy, uh, sell and buy for. This saw, for an example, it's only five years old and it costs you $5,000. In reality, you might be able to sell it for $4,000 if it's still in really good shape or it may be worth nothing. At any rate, the fair market value would determine that. Now, what does this mean? We, we, we can see what it's done for our book value of our company, but now let's talk about what it did for our tax exposure. Each year when we wrote off that $1,000, and we call that uh, depreciation, that depreciation $1,000 number was subtracted from our tax exposure that year. The following year, we get another $1,000 tax break. Or a write-off. So this is how tax breaks, write-offs, and depreciation come to play in our tax planning for our business. I've got to say now, the book value of a business is all about the assets, uh, the depreciation that have accumulated uh, and been uh, taken away from the original purchase price. Know that in my opinion, that book value concept is, is overrated big time because there is no direct relationship between fair market value and book value. So a lot of people get confused when they're talking about it. This will come into play if you're thinking about selling your business or if you are applying for a loan at the bank. The bankers have to consider the book value because that's where they track how much money you've invested in assets and what those assets are worth now. Uh, but there's another factor that's going to come into play that will make your uh, company look like it's worth a lot more money because it is, and that's by using the concept of the fair market value, which is what the, uh, the company would actually sell for if you were selling it. But it's two values. I want you to make sure you keep them all together. All right, we're going to talk about now, moving into part three, the write-offs and the deductions. Anybody want to raise a hand and ask a question before I go into part three? Return your mic on. We'll be glad to hear you. Okay, it's an open mic whenever you want it to be. All right. So, how does uh, how does business tax deductions work? As we just said, we'll take our deduction to lower our taxable income. So, the more deductions we have the less tax will be paying. And how do you figure out uh, how much money to claim on a depreciated item? Well, listen to me carefully. That is the CPA's job. It is not my job because there's a lot of different formulas and things that might apply. Uh, how much money you borrowed on it, the amortization, how fast you're paying it off. It is not a simple thing to do right off the top. It is an accounting practice, so keep that in mind. That's why we hire them. That's why you have them, because as a business grows, uh, this has so much to do with how much tax you, you have to pay out. It's a very important issue 
uh, as a way to save your money with deductions. Again, we talked about the different kinds of expenses. We're going back over that again. You've got general business expenses, which are the cost for, for just running your business. It's all the things that we have to do day after day, month after month, to, to, uh, to keep our business going. The capital expenses are the big purchases, the things that hang around, those assets that we're proud to own and hang on to. They're not used up. They're not used up, so we're going to keep up with the value of those so we'll know what the book value of our business is. So let's compare some different items now uh, to see if it's a capital expense or a deductible regular business expense. Let's talk about a $250 printer like I've got right here beside me, this HP 450. That cost me about 250 bucks. And in my business, my small business, I don't depreciate, I don't capitalize that asset because it will last me, well, hopefully another 10 years. I've had it about four years, and it's running just fine. So that printer is on my books as an asset. And we put it on there at $250, and I'll depreciate it uh, as we go along. But maybe your business or some business you know, I would say it's a, a large insurance company, and they got agents all over the United States, and every one of them's got one of these printers, and they buy them by the thousand, uh, and and so that big insurance company would probably not, well, certainly not keep up with each printer and capitalize it, because just think of all the paperwork that would cause if nothing else. They would probably write that right off every year as a general business expense. So every business has the option to, to handle their uh, items that they depreciate and how fast they depreciate them uh, independently uh, based on what their needs are to, uh, to meet their tax goals. But if I bought a $2,500 printer, and most small businesses or offices when they do that, that's a large enough expense that you're expecting it to last a long, long time you would definitely consider it a capital expense and put it in your depreciation items. The paper that we bought on either one of them, let's say we bought some cases of paper, spent 250 bucks, that paper would never go on the depreciation list because it's a disposable item. It would be written off the first year it was purchased. A set of tires for a truck at $2,000? Well, in my business, I would depreciate a set of tires. Because well, they didn't use my trucks a lot, that would last about 10 years. That set of tires usually would last us at least five years, sometimes 10 years, and I'd depreciate it. But if I was a large trucking company and bought a $17,000 engine, I'd definitely depreciate it, and most trucking companies would as well. But let's say now I was renting a forklift for one reason or another. Anytime I say the word rent, Forget about deduct uh, a cap capitalized item. It would just be a general business deduction whenever we mention rent, okay? Payroll, business expense, 100% write-off. $2,500 uh, CPA fee, write-off. There's nothing to show for it after you pay for it, so, except what you're putting in your, uh, in your files that you're going to keep forever. $4,000 uh, shop tool set. Ah, let's talk about that a minute. Almost never, nobody would go out and buy $4,000 worth of hand tools at one time. But all of us in business, no matter what the type of trade, we'll end up with some special tools of the trade or instruments. So I'll say to you, this is important. Keep up with the, 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 the tools that are gonna last you a long, long time even if you're buying them one at a time. Keep a list of that, an inventory, and then at the end of the year, combine those items into a tool set. This is on paper and in real, so that you will be able to take uh, these tools that you bought one at a time, lump them together into one value, and, and you can uh, depreciate that if you care to, and uh, always be able to have proof that you still got them and they still got value. Let's say that you're paying a, a monthly rental on a forklift. Again, rent, write off. Everything that's delivered to you, transportation cost and delivery, 100% write off. 
But now, and I, I was in the forklift rental business for a lot of years and rented hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, let's say that you rented a forklift for 24 months at a thousand bucks a month. This is a general pretty much about what they rent for these days. And at the end of that 24 month rental period, you had the option to buy it for $5,000. And you decided to exercise that option. So let's talk about that a minute. For 24 months, you have paid a thousand bucks and you wrote that off every month. General business expense, all rentals. But then and after a while, you were able to write a check for $5,000 and buy that forklift. That check for $5,000, buying the forklift allows you to put that forklift onto your books and depreciate it. The key here is it goes on your books, not for $24,000 that you invested in it, but goes on your books for $5,000 that you actually paid for it when you made the purchase. The other $24,000 has already been written off your books as a a regular business expense. So now let's come back and focus on book value and fair market value. The forklift that you paid five thousand dollars for is probably going to be worth nineteen or twenty thousand bucks. So, related to the forklift, your fair market value would be twenty four, twenty five thousand bucks, but your book value is only showing five thousand. That's why you got to be savvy uh, and look at these things carefully when you're considering the difference in the two. Now, I dug into uh, some records and looked as, as far as I could. Uh, to come up with a a program we could fit into the two-hour program today. And I've I've tried to uh, uh, use the information I could find to share with you the 25 business deductions that most most, uh, entrepreneurs will use. Uh, Down close to the end, sometimes we might not have a chance to use some of them, but most of these are going to be very important. In the handout that was mailed to you, all this text uh, that we'll talk about on each one is explained. So you may want to actually take that one step at a time, read each about each one of these deductions and see how it may apply to you for the next coming year so that you'll be able to better keep your records. See, we're getting right back to record keeping uh, now that we're talking about the different deductions that you might use. So. Generally, your business meals, uh, you can deduct as you're out here doing work. And a uh, general rule of thumb, 50% of your food and drink is, is considered deductible. And whether or not you're entertaining a client or not, that client's percentage might be 100%. So you'll want to keep up with when you're uh, doing a business meal, uh, where you were, who your client was, uh, keep up with your tickets or your receipts, and log it into your log. If you're doing this on a regular basis, like I used to do as a salesman on the road, I had a, a log book and every day I'd, I'd, I'd list everything down uh, so I could turn it into our, our, our secretary. Now I very seldom do this and pretty much just keep up with it on my uh, credit card receipts that I get in. But you'll want to keep up with all your business uh, meal records. Work-related travel expenses uh, are going to be very important to you, and they certainly can, uh, in, include things like hotels or rental car expenses or tips or dry cleaning meals and things like that. But you, you, again, you'll want to keep up uh, so that you with it and, and prove that it was a, a part of your business and necessary to your business. Uh, keep up with it, where you went and, and a little another why you went uh, went there. Uh, and that way it could be a very important uh, deduction for you as you go. Uh, the distance that you go away to travel, let's say that you just, that you just uh, uh, traveled a, a little way away and then you want to claim that you uh, a, a night's uh, uh, lodging, that's probably not going to work. But, so give some serious consideration to be as forthright as you can with this. Work-related car use is always something that we talk about a lot. 
with everyone thinking about their deductions. Uh, two things that you're going to want to consider. First, uh, you are able to pay all the expenses on your car yourself and then keep up with the mileage that was uh, business related and the business re gets to reimburse you 56 cents per mile that you drove doing business. So that's to say that if you drove your car or your pickup truck 100 miles, your business gets to pay you back $56. You pay all the expenses. The other way you might want to look at this is just to say this particular vehicle is 100% business use. And if that's the case, and you, you don't need to prove it, if that's the case, uh, the business can pay all the expenses related to the car. You'll, you'll get some pretty tight scrutiny, especially if that vehicle is in your name instead of in the business's name. I have found that in most situations, if you don't have a fleet of trucks or five or six uh, vehicles involved in this conversation, you're better off to personally own the, uh, the, the vehicle and reimburse yourself the mileage rate. Uh, you're generally able to make payments on a, on a very nice used vehicle and, uh, and, and keep it up and be able to trade it at the rates that they offer from uh, the government. But again, keep up with your mileage. Uh, even if it's just at the post office in the bank every day, or if you're traveling out to give meetings or meet with customers, this is a time that if you're doing a lot of this, that you really need to keep a daily log. And of course, that's, that log would have a, a uh, related uh, meal expenses or lodging, uh, extra expenses that came out of the blue, and your mileage. Uh, that way you'll be able to uh, justify the deduction that you're taking. So you see now, let's think about this. The, the money that you spend conducting your business will be called a deduction. It will be subtracted from your general income to lower your tax exposure. Insurances are very important. Uh, sometimes young folks, uh, young entrepreneurs just don't feel like I've got the money to buy the insurance I need for my personal security and that of my family or for the business. Uh, business uh, insurance payments are 100% write-off deduction as long as the business is the beneficiary. Uh, life insurance policies that the business may be paying for, uh, you'll need to get some, uh, some good advice from your uh, insurance person as to how you can take advantage of personal life insurance and let your company pay the bill for it. Uh, there's some uh, do's and don'ts in this, but I think generally the rule of thumb is that if your company is at least 51% beneficiary, then it gets to pay the bill and therefore you get the advantage of insurance coverage without having to pay for it with your uh, after-tax income. So insurances are important. Get some good advice on that. Oh boy, home office expenses. Uh, just are, are always uh, very interesting for folks. Even if you have an office uh, in a bricks and mortar building, but you come home and you bring your home work with you, yes, you can have home office expenses, even, you get, even though you've got a business uh, somewhere else, but you're not keep up, keep up with uh, uh, what, the, what the value of the space is that you're using, how much square feet, uh, uh, the people at FreshBooks that I got this particular information from uh, said that 300 square feet is the maximum amount of footage that you can claim in your percentage of, 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 of your home expenses. So, for example, if you had a 3,000 uh, square foot home and your office is 300 square feet, that means that 10% of your household expenses uh, could be written off as office expenses. That gets real quite complicated sometimes and will vary with each person. I would like to give you an option, and that is if you can build and have an outside building that you can qualify as your office, then you get you would be able to rent that building to your company and let the company pay you rental each month. And you get a, a, a whole lot less things to keep up with uh, by doing that 
and it's a cleaner subject, which generally uh, isn't challenged by the auditors and such as that. Well, I've been paying myself $625 a month rent for lots and lots of years for the use of the office we're sitting in right here, and it's a, a, a good way to do that. That 625 is taxable income to me, but it's a direct write-off, a direct write-off for the company, so it's pretty much a wash. Office supplies. And when you actually give consideration to how many pads and printer paper and printer ink and things like that that we use, it's really amazing. You also want to consider in here, this is where you would log in your software expenses, uh, your, uh, your uh, things that you're doing to uh, improve and repair your devices. Uh, a lot of us, that can get to be very expensive, especially as our business grows or we start doing new things. Uh, this past month, I've, I needed to upgrade the bandwidth on my internet because the, the signals I was sending out on my uh, provider that I had, uh, it, they just didn't give me enough bandwidth. And I didn't know about bandwidth, but I certainly learned. But by adding a business account, I was able to get about 10 times more internet speed and bandwidth than with a, a residential account. And actually, uh, with programs that are going on, was able to save money to get a whole lot more power. So if you're having issues with that, you might want to look into, are you going to be better off with a, a business account for your uh, internet service? And if so, you might find out that the deals out there are, are quite attractive. Now, that's a good question. Is that money that I'm spending for internet service, is that a, a capital expense or a business expense? It's a write-off. It's a 100% general business operating expense. Phone and internet expenses can just go out the roof. Uh, you've probably got your phones in your own name like I do. Uh, generally, uh, about 90% of everything I do on the phone is related to my business, and I take those bills, and that's what I charge for. So uh, as you're looking at those deductions, just consider well, which phone number it is and how much time is used for business such as that. Uh, generally, uh, folks are writing off about 50% of their Internet expenses uh, if, if you got it all mixed up with your personal use. Interest is a write-off, always has been. Bank fees are as well. But I'll give you special caution now. You may be like I am in that I do a lot of credit card business. And the credit cards, of, of course, are charging us an average of 3.5% across the board on my Square account. And on top of that, uh, that money is going into a bank, and the bank is charging me a service fee to handle it. So look very carefully at these fees that you're paying uh, to, the, to the credit card companies, plus what the banks are charging you to manage those accounts. It can add up to quite a bit of money. Uh, it takes you, uh, so in your record keeping, as these bills come in, you want to keep those in a separate place so that you can go back and find them quite easily. Professional uh, service fees. Bookkeepers, accounting, lawyers, uh, counseling, training, uh, those kind of things, keep up with those expenses. They are 100% write-offs, uh, no questions asked, but you just need to prove that you uh, have paid the bills. Okay, the salaries and benefits, just no doubt about it. But the good news is, is not only can you write off salaries and benefits, but you can also uh, uh, write off uh, vacations uh, that are paid for, paid for employees' vacations time, <clears throat> different things like that. Uh, you'll want to consider uh, every aspect of your uh, employment relations and how they might add up uh, to becoming a uh, deduction for you. Uh, so this is an area that can get a little bit uh, webby, like a, a spider web. So talk to your uh, CPA about this. Uh, 
as you start adding employees and see that you're writing up the deductions as best as you can. And this is one of those areas where you structure your business in such a way to help you limit your amount of taxes. And this is not tax, uh, tax evasion, but there is a lot of tax avoidance available in how you set up your employee files so that everybody is legal, but you as the employer are paying the least amount of taxes and getting the best deductions for it. I want to encourage you as a, a, a business person, entrepreneur, to be charitable. Uh, generally, uh, uh, when you are making uh, donations to people in your community, to your church, to the service organizations and such as that, not only does it make you feel good about you're doing a good part, a good corporate uh, member uh, uh, part of the community to try to help the move, community to move forward, forward, but also people notice. People notice uh, uh, people that count. Uh, people that know people notice when a company or a entrepreneur is generous uh, contributor. Yeah, you might be generous at the country club or generous with your boat or generous with your airplane or generous with your trips. All those are just fine. You work hard to make that money. But remember that the, 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 the churches and the, and the service organizations and the scouts, they need contributions as well. Of course, that is a 100% tax write-off for you. Uh, uh, you'll make friends by doing it, and you'll save quite a bit of tax money. So something just to consider. I consider uh, personally that those investments have come back to me tenfold through the years. And, I, of course, I, don't, I have a limited amount that I can do, but I do what I can every week, every month. I encourage you to do the same. Educational expenses can, can be incurred in a lot of different ways. Uh, traveling, uh, trade publications, books related to your industry, actually going to classes, paying uh, tuitions, uh, buying a seat in a seminar or webinar. All these expenses are deductible for entrepreneurs, so try to keep up with them, okay? Child care. Big, big deal is for all of us uh, with, with children, of course. And now you've got a lot of laws that are on the books that help you deduct uh, your child care expenses uh, while you're trying to get your business up and running or working every day. So uh, different situations in different parts of the nation are a little bit different. So make sure you, if, you're, if you do have children or different other types of adult dependents, Find out if maybe the money you're spending to, to uh, uh, look after them while you're running your business, I think you'll find there's going to be a good chance that you're going to have some deductions available to you when you do that. You've all heard about putting the solar panels up, do the solar hot water, buy a solar automobile or a solar truck. You'll get a really good uh, tax advantage by doing that. All that is true. Uh, those uh, credits are available to you, so if you have the available income and you're planning to do this anyway, make sure that you uh, uh, talk with uh, your accountant before you go spend that big money based on what some salesman has said to you. You want to know for sure that, that uh, you're going to get these tax deductions before you make that money and you got everything documented. Uh, uh, someone told me last year that they had bit the bullet and made a major expense on on uh, energy savings. And, and, and then when the uh, when the uh, time to do the taxes and they thought they were going to get a big deduction on it, they found out that they had misunderstood or something had been misrepresented to them, and they were not able to get the deductions that they needed. So look into that very carefully. Trucks, buses, your office, lots and lots of folks uh, are looking at energy, energy savings and hopefully to get some uh, tax advantages by doing it. A couple of things that maybe aren't going to affect you now as your business is brand new or you're just getting started, but different types of investments that you make, the interest that you pay on loans, some of these are going to be deductible and some are pretty hefty, hefty deductions. Uh, many that you make from uh, overseas uh, may or may not be excluded from your 
uh, tax reporting. So these two things are definitely uh, can get complicated, and you'll need to visit with your CPA about it. That's, that's why they're there, but they can be really big issues for you. Medical expenses, not only for you, but for your employees or what you're spending to, to, uh, to make it happen. Uh, these healthcare expenses and doctor fees, prescription drugs, uh, all may come into the, uh, to your deduction list. It probably will. The key here is how you keep your records. So, uh, starting right now, uh, 2023, save your records as you can, make a list of them. Uh, and so that you'll be able to take the maximum amount of uh, deductions, get the best help that you can. This includes dental and eye care. Real estate taxes are really important. So let's say that you're the entrepreneur, you're working out of your home. Those taxes are a part of your home expense, and therefore those taxes will probably go over when you consider your home office deduction. So look into these, see what the, the best ways that you can uh, make that work for you. Same thing on mortgage interest, uh, whether it's personal or business, and, and, and the mortgage is on your home office, then that comes into play. If the, if the company is buying property right now, the mortgage interest would definitely be deductible. But I want to caution you here is a good place to stop. It's perfectly great for you as an individual to show that you own real estate and you're, you're paying a mortgage on it because mortgages usually bring an asset to your personal uh, to your personal financial statement because you bought it at a good deal or you paid some down payment on it, so you've got equity there. And equity is great for your personal financial statement. On the other hand, if you're a new business, and even if you can and you're thinking about buying your office or buying real estate in the business name, sometimes that is an awful idea. Because Mr. Banker, Mr. Corey here, as you all know, that across the history of entrepreneurship, a lot of startup companies go out of business in just a few years. The percentage of those that make it are slim. The percentage of those of us that, that, that make it are, are, are far less than everybody that tries. So therefore, a banker or a lender is going to have very little interest in making a long-term loan to a group of entrepreneurs who have a short-term uh, record of getting in trouble. What's the better plan? The better plan, if you need to own the, the business, I mean, if you need to own the property, is to buy that as an individual and then lease it to your company. When you do that, the only thing on the company's financial statement will be the first 12 months rent. Yeah, in a lease, you don't list down the total amount of the mortgage or a loan that someone took out on the property. The business, when they're renting it, would just put down their one year uh, income exposure uh, for paying rent. So instead of having a $300,000 loan on your business book, you would just show that you're going to need to pay $30,000 in rent. And that's a lot easier to deal with uh, than, than having a long term debt there. So rethink your thinking if you're going to plan to start a new business and automatically buy real estate. Uh, and have to borrow the money on it. That is not going to do your financial statement any good whatsoever. Moving expenses for you personally or your business, depending on which one it applies. If the, if the uh, money is being spent to promote your business, uh, to cover that, then it certainly will be considered a deduction for the, for the business and or deduction for you if you're filing an individual that keep it up with your business records. Retirement contributions, your IRAs, uh, in some cases are deductible. Uh, I'm personally not into that. I, I have an IRA, but because of my age, I, I, I haven't had to do much studying about it in recent years. But I'm sure that IRAs have a significant tax advantage for you uh, while you're making those payments. 
and you want to consider that very carefully. Advertising and promotion. Now this we can't really home in on. I can tell you that when things get tight, one of the first things that an entrepreneur in their budget will cut is advertising and promotion. I'll tell you that when you're first getting started, sometimes it's really hard to find those few extra dollars to promote your business, to advertise. Why? Because it's intangible. But I need to encourage you to always spend this money wisely and don't waste it. And when you are spending it wisely, advertising and promotional funds are investments in the future of your company. And it is a 100% tax write-off, no questions asked. So this is a good place. And if you're wanting to jumpstart your business and to get it started, is to invest wisely in advertising and promotion. Now, in a number of our classes, we show you how to invest so you get a return on that advertising money and glad to share it. So uh, if you want to move your company forward but not quite sure how to, how to promote it, uh, let's let's get on board with some of our classes and see how we can teach you to make the right kind of investments. Generally, here's the rule of thumb: you can't be everything to everybody. Our business, my business, can't be all things to all people, but we must be everything to some people. And when we're focusing on being everything to some people, and those some people being our targeted audiences we can direct our advertising and promotional money at those smaller audiences and get a lot better return on that investment. 90% in my feeling, in my opinion, 90 to 95% of all advertising money is spent is just wasted, just plain wasted. And I don't want to play in that game. I certainly don't want you to. So when you do targeted advertising and promotions, you got a good chance of getting a real good return on that investment. I like to call it that we want to do this with the look and the hook. We want our advertising to look good so that people take the time to read it. And inside that advertising, we want a hook. A hook is something that get, makes them interested in calling you up right now. I call that a call to action. The look and the hook, and each ad having a call to action in it. <laughs> yeah, I joke in my, in my seminar, I want every one of you to be a great hooker. Uh, so, so that you can learn to uh, do advertising that's got a hook in it. Keep that in mind. It, it, it's, it's one of the areas that most people just getting started do not spend enough, enough of their money in. But I say that with a great big word of caution because it is easy to waste money here. So we want to make sure we do it right. We've got a lot of seminars and studies that can help you uh, get started the right way. Client and employee entertainment, looking at it as a deduction. Uh, yes, I want you to take clients out, and I want you to discuss business, and I want you to take a, a, a deductions for that. The general rule of thumb is 50% of the cost of entertainment expenses uh, you can take as a deduction. But if you, as an employer, are hosting an event for your employees, you can uh, deduct 100% for the money you spend on your employees. That's pretty good to know. I wasn't aware of those particular numbers before before I saw this at FreshBooks. Startup expenses, big, big deal. If you're starting a new business and you were doing it last year, according to the article I was reading, you can deduct five, up to $5,000, uh, even though your business is not up and running, but you're, you're, you're getting ready to start up a new business launch. This is important because I want you to be able to deduct every single penny that you're using to get your business started up. And I think the key here is between what I would like for you to be able to do and, and knowing whether you do it or not is how you keep your records, uh, what what you're buying, uh, what what uh, what much you're spending, when you do it, and proving that you can put it into play. Uh, usually $5,000 will cover pretty much everything you got to do until you get over into your regular business plan. And in your business plan, you'll be listing down the, your, your, uh, your expenses there 
and they will come into your bigger financial statement uh, and, and will not be classified as startup expenses if your business is already up and running. So we need to spend some time on that with our bookkeeper and our accountant to be able to write off all of our startup expenses that we possibly can. Okay? That's, that's basically what we've been talking about there. So if, is it boring? It is, and I'm sorry for having to unload 25 boring topics on you, but indeed in tax, uh, tax evasion and in tax avoidance, you do your tax avoidance with deductions. So that's why it's important that you're aware of that. And you know there are others as well, but those are the kind of the top 25 that you'll want to keep on your mind as you're moving forward. Let's talk about taxes in general now. Every time I talk with an accountant, the CPA, I ask them this question. What tip or hint would you have me give to new entrepreneurs that are attending our webinars related to their business and their future taxes? Almost every one of them, like they were reading it out of the same book, will say, Steve, encourage this brand new business person just now starting to collect taxes, just now starting to have employees, just now starting to have uh, tax exposure. See, I'm still in business, the phone's still ringing here. We have three calls come in. I'm asking the folks if I'm calling back because y'all are the most important people in the room. But the, the, uh, the, the accountants will say, encourage your new entrepreneurs to pigeonhole or to take out the tax monies that they're collecting or the tax monies they're going to owe related to their employee expenses and set it aside. Keep a separate account and keep it line item. Make sure that we don't get caught into the trap of bringing in a lot of money uh, that included some sales tax revenue or a lot of labor cost and using that money for other bills and then the end of the month comes and you owe these taxes now that it's gone. It is so important that you don't do that. What you want to do is to set aside that money, know how much is going to have to be going out on those tax paying dates so that you're ready to do it. Every year, the accountants tell me, and I see it myself as well, folks who get a business started, they're doing really good, making the money, putting it in the bank, and paying those bills as soon as they can, and end up, when it's time to pay the taxes, realize that they paid, paid stuff too early, and they don't have enough money for their tax payments. And if you do not have a credit line or a, a cash reserve or someone to bail you out, when those tax payments are due, they're due. And the tax authority will come in and chain lock your door and put you out of business right then. So it happens. So, and, and the times that it becomes most critical is not when business is slow. It's when business is booming and you are having a large influx of, of money coming in. And we just by human nature, want to pay our bills as soon as we can when we got some reserves and pay out uh, some things too early. And then when it's time to pay the taxes, we don't have anything left there. This is a big deal. So pigeonhole your tax obligation money so that you're not caught in a bind. New businesses uh, need to know certain things about federal taxes. So my first advice to you is to hire an experienced bookkeeper, hopefully that's had some understanding of your type of business. And hire an experienced CPA. Now generally CPAs already have some experience because to get that CPA they had to go through a training uh, session for several years. But what you as a brand new person who I don't want to say is a novice or ignorant about things, but we don't know much when we're brand new. What you don't want to do is just get started up with a bookkeeper that's brand new and or a CPA that's brand new because there's a lot of ignorance in the room. Find someone with experience that can give you good advice that you can have a lot of confidence with. It's very, very important. 
What's the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion? Two big words, right? <clears throat> well, one's legal and one's not. And tax avoidance, tax avoidance is is uh, exporting the tax system to reduce your liabilities. That is legal. I want you to do it. It's the way you'll stay in business. Because there are so many taxes out there and they can get so complicated that you want to make sure that you structure your books and the way you do business in the way that you are legal, but also uh, dodging as many tax payments as you can. Tax evasion is when you're lying or cheating or putting up, up uh, presentations that are totally false, and that's going to get you in trouble. But tax avoidance is what we're doing this afternoon. We're having a class about how to avoid taxes, and entrepreneurs need to do that. Tax evasion will end up putting you in jail because, indeed, it is legal, uh, illegal, and those folks have no sense of humor at all when it comes to that. <clears throat> now, who are you going to be sending this money to? You get in business just like uh, uh, everyone else uh, does that ever does it. You don't have to face the same issues. And we're going to be sending money out, our hard-earned money, and we can't send this money out unless it's part of our profits. So we're going to be giving away part of our profits so that we can be so proud to be at work in America, and that is a good thing. But I want to caution you now, the people that you don't take your uh, tax records to, there's a lot that you can do to save money. Every, if you plan on taking that big uh, bag of, of invoices and documents and saying to your tax preparer, okay, here it is, take care of it. Well, an accountant gets paid for accounting. And every document that you give to a tax professional is going to be picked up and, and looked at and summarized and uh, noted uh, in the system, every piece of document that you send. And accountants get paid by the hour. So the more hours worth that you take in there with little pieces of paper, the higher your bill is going to be. Here's, here's a solution that will help you save a lot of money. Organize all your tax records. Organize all your invoices and payments. Put them in piles, uh, in like piles. And then you add up the different piles, the summaries. So that what you're carrying to the accountant is a summary of all these other numbers. You don't even have to give them all the numbers, just give them the summary figure. And they can take that number and plug it right into your tax form and therefore save you lots of time and lots of money because you did some of it yourself. It also will give you a good understanding of what's going on with your books. So at least uh, uh, your first few years, do it yourself. So you'll see uh, who's writing checks and for how much. But carrying that big brown paper bag to the accountant is just going to cost you some extra money. And we don't give money to a lot of different folks. The city government gets some of your money. The county government gets some of your money, state and federal. And the city is the town clerk. The county is the tax collector for your individual county. And the state is the North Carolina DOR. And feds are the IRS or the U.S. Treasury. And they'll collect money a lot of different ways. It'll be permits or license or estimates or fees different names, I just call them all taxes. We're really fortunate, and let me tell you, we need to count our blessings from time to time, because generally our town clerks and county tax collectors and the North Carolina state government are really helpful for entrepreneurs, really helpful for startups who don't know anything except how to get started. So let me give you a word of comfort in that it's probably going to be a pleasant experience as much as it could be for you to talk to and get help from these folks. Now, of course, the, the city and the county are in their prospective areas, but the North Carolina DOR has regional offices and spread all over the state, 
and where you can actually go and make an appointment for us and go and ask to sit down and talk with an entrepreneur specialist about what you need to know to get your taxes in line, your sales tax, your withholding, uh, unemployment issues. They have programs to really help entrepreneurs. And if you look at their website, they'll tell you when they're going to be at different areas, they go out and give webinars and seminars as well, sometimes in cooperation with the local small business center. I'm very thankful that these folks do communicate with you quite well. Now, in my opinion, the U.S. government, of course, I know, <coughs> is bound to have some good, friendly folks, too. I just have a hard time finding them, especially with the phone systems and being put on hold and listed to menus. Also, my years of experience have taught me one thing, and I will share that with you for you to consider. If you're having to get information from the U.S. government, the taxing people, about your business, and particularly an issue that you're uncertain about, I want to encourage you to have your CPA to be the liaison between you and the government. The, your CPA, when they call, don't even have to give them or mention your name. They can, they can uh, act on your behalf, get the information you need, and y'all can talk about it and determine what course you might want to take on any issue. Going to the U.S. government without having a CPA on your side is like going into a courtroom, a criminal courtroom, in a serious trial without having a lawyer by your side. Not good advice. So when you're dealing with the government, I suggest that you let your CPA do that work. It'll take a lot of stress off of you, and you will probably get the right questions answered. <laughs> and the most important part, they'll be talking with someone that can understand the right questions to ask and then understand understand the uh, the options. So those are the people that you're going to be dealing with. Uh, don't be afraid. I'm just giving you the answers where you can do it. The, uh, the, the city folks, you can find them at the clerk's office downtown. The county folks at the, at the county seat, they'll be very helpful for you. Uh, these slides and in your handouts are basically telling you who to call and where they're located at, the different services that they're at. Uh, you can find different types of uh, web pages that will help you, but I wanted to give you the address and phone numbers in case you needed to call somebody. Kind of boiling it down, the main type of taxes are withholding tax, privileged licenses to do business, unemployment insurance, and your different franchise taxes. Uh, congratulations, you're going to get to pay a franchise tax, whether you own a McDonald's or a Chick-fil-A or not. You know, that's something on your federal and state returns where no matter whether you made any money or not, we get to pay what's called a franchise tax just for the privilege of, uh, of being able to do business in the United States. Uh, you know, interesting, that's what they named it. So. If you didn't make any money, you probably don't know how to pay any income tax, but on that form, they don't hit you up for one or $200 for a franchise tax. Now, I need to bring to you about the county government. <clears throat> the feds, the federal government, and the state government are going to tax us on our income, on our profit. Profit. What's left? What's left after all these deductions and all this depreciation is what our taxes are based on with the feds and the state government. But the county, the county comes at it in a different way. Remember, I mentioned depreciation sheet and assets. Well, the county's interested in how many assets that you are holding on to. They don't care how much money you made this year or last year or what your income was. They want to know how many assets you're holding within their county. Vehicles, inventory, tools, real estate, different types of equipment, and on and on and on. Because that's how they make their money. They will take your uh, your your value, and we're going to come back to book value now uh, on some items. It's your book value on cars and 
you know, the trailers and things like that, the real estate is fair market value. So the county will look at your asset sheet and take that book value right off of it. And then they'll ask you to tell, tell them about your cars and trucks or real estate, and they will hire appraisers uh, to appraise your properties and assign a fair market value on that. The combination of those two items will be your tax exposure. Okay? So if you had never filled out a business county tax return, get ready. Because when you file for your taxes, and you need to file every year to tell the county government what assets you have, you'll give them all your information, and they'll send you a tax bill. The key is you're supposed to file for those taxes by December 31st. And if you do not do it, you'll be fined 10% for a late filing. So it's right at the end of December when you get your uh, tax uh, listing sheet from the county, I want you to go to their website, type in that you want an extension on filing these taxes until April 15th. So you need to do that if you're if, if, a, if an accountant or an accounting firm is doing your, your, your tax returns because they probably will wait very close to April 15th before you ever get it back. And until you get that back from the accountant, you won't know what's on the depreciation sheet. You have a good guess based on your historical record, but you won't know exactly, and it's important, that the exact numbers that are on your year-end depreciation sheet are the ones that you transfer over to the tax form that the county sent you. That's right. That's pretty much all that you need to fill out your county tax form is your current year's depreciation sheet. That's how they work together. Now, I want you to stay off of, to not be audited. Auditing is not fun. Uh, it's just something that may happen. The good news is that less than 1% of all businesses and individuals will be audited. But I will also tell you that there are certain things that you can do to really improve the chances you will be. And by knowing that and you stay away from it, there's some good things that you can do not to put up red flags and invite the auditors to jump on you. So let's talk about these things that might help you avoid that audit. Number one, Stay away from shady, crooked tax preparers. And the world is has plenty of them, and probably some of them, right in your neighborhood. Uh, they, they take advantage of people. They say, I'm going to guarantee you a great big refund if you let me do your taxes. And they'll put in uh, shady information, and a big refund will come. And they'll have to figure out how they get a major portion of it, a share, and you get the rest. But at the end of the day, after the auditors come and, and, and find out about the shady preparers, the, the preparer is going to be long gone, and you're going to end up facing a uh, tax audit to pay back a lot of money that you never got. You know these commercials that you see late at night during tax season? Uh, they usually start about 11.30 at night with someone that says, I owed the tax people $25,000 or I owed them $50,000 and so-and-so tax relief people came in and helped me out. i got to think in my mind that probably a lot of these people's problems started when they filed a shady tax return and took a lot of uh, deductions or claimed a lot of uh, refunds that they were due and the hammers come down on them. So what do you do? You, 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 you're the first time with your business taxes. Find someone that's been around a long time that you know and trust and can give you some references or go to a certain firm and get some help. In certain areas, I'm happy to recommend different firms to you and that your small business centers would be as well. Just stay away from the crooks because so they're out there and they're generally, they're generally they are the people with a sign on their truck or their office door that is guaranteeing you a large refund. Because there's no way they can guarantee you a large refund legally. 
up front. Your unreported income will get you in trouble. I know you're just getting started, and I'm going to say that as long as you're just kind of milking a, uh, a hobby and turn it into an income uh, producing thing, you got a lot of flexibility. Those people may be paying you tips and, and just giving you a gift instead of paying for your services. But you can't wear that out. So the, the very time that you're starting to uh, make some significant amount of money, I want you to start keeping a good record of that, another log. Because here's the good part. If you're doing that, you can also start keeping up with your expenses. And almost always, your expenses will offset your income to the point that it becomes null. When your business is a reality and becoming sustainable, then you need to, to, uh, to file every penny that you get in, uh, keep your records good and tight. You need to know that if you're paying someone uh, uh, over $600 a year to, to help you, you're required by law to make sure you have a W-2 form, I mean a, a, a W-9 form with their name, address, social security number, and all that. And you are, uh, by law, supposed to give them a 1099 income statement and or the W-2 form. So these are important. When you're hiring people, uh, make sure you remember that $600 rule. If you're working for other folks now, getting your business started, and you're bringing in over six, you're going to take in over six hundred dollars. Then you're going to need to file that ten ninety nine statement from whoever the employer is. They may not want to give it to you, and you may not want to see it. But as Greg said earlier, if you're making money, you have to pay the taxes on it. So, Steve, can uh, I uh, just say something? Uh, just ask you a question while you're in this vein. Absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of us small businesses are self, well, self-employed. We're filing a self-employed, not as employees of our company. So when he's talking about the W-2 and the W-9, that's when you are an employee. The 1099 is when you are a self-employed individual, um, and um, there are certain things that are uh, involved. First of all, as an employee, the employer is taking out Social Security and Medicare and federal income tax out of your check. That's why what you get is net, and you see the deductions on your payroll check. As a self-employed person, an independent contractor, you are not getting a check that has things taken out. And when the employer is taking things out um, and you're getting that check as an employee, the employer is also paying half of the Social Security and Medicare requirement. As a self-employed person, an independent contractor, you have to pay 100% of that stuff somehow. So, Steve, I don't know if you have anything in there about estimated quarterly payments and things like that in this webinar, but it might be something you just want to mention just to, so that they understand that. Many of them, I don't even know if they know that that um, they're not going to be getting a check, then they need to be taking an owner's draw or how far, how deep into that you need to go. But I just want to um, bring it up about the self-employment tax, uh, Medicare, Social Security, uh, quarterly estimated taxes, and also uh, sales tax that they get. You touched on that, and I kind of cut you off before you could get into the sales tax they collected off uh, whatever they sell if they're selling products. I quit. Very, very good, and I, uh, and I meant to do this. I'm slide. sorry. No, you brought up something that I forgot, so I'm gonna spend a few seconds on it here. Okay. Uh, Greg is talking exactly right. It, uh, like me, and like maybe you, are the only person in the business at this point in time. And you don't want to pay Social Security taxes, and you don't want to take out uh, uh, workman's comp and such as that. You've got that covered other ways with other insurance or maybe in your other job. But still, you need to take money out of your company to pay your bills or to get a return on your investment. So that money needs to, co needs to come to you, but it needs to come to you in such a way that you're going to, to report it. If, if you don't report it, you're going to stand the chance of getting in trouble. So how, how can you do that? 
Well, the way that you do that, instead of writing yourself a payroll check, which involves all those taxes, you write yourself a check and call it a consulting fee. A consulting fee. In other words, your company is paying you for your consulting services, for your management services and such as that. But they're not paying you as a W-2 income type thing. But those consulting fees will be taxable. They will be taxable. But the good news is you're not going to have to pay the Social Security tax on it, the workman's comp issues, and maybe other issues. So now once those consulting fees are being paid, and you can pay them once a week like, as its salary, or you can pay it uh, when you actually need to take a draw is to pay yourself then, or on any other type of schedule that you choose to do. And some of us will not take that check until the end of the year after we get a feel for how much our, our tax liability will be because that consulting fee is a direct write-off for your company. So paying you the fee reduces your company taxes, but it is a tax to you. After the first time you do that, as Greg just mentioned, then you're going to need to start doing an estimated tax payment, quarterly tax payment, uh, all through the year for the rest of your years that you do it. So that the government is saying, okay, you're going to start taking this money, and we don't want to wait till the end of the year to get our tax part of it. So they're going to say to you every quarter, you're going to need to send us a quarterly tax payment based on how much money you think that you're going to take out of your company as a consulting fee. So that's the way that works. And it is a and real that's good for you too, isn't it, Steve? Because uh, you're not getting a big surprise at the end of the year and a big, huge uh, tax bill. It is a good thing to do because you manage it as you do. And plus, if you want to, if you want to pay in a little more, so that you, uh, so that you feel like you're going to get a tax return, uh, you can do that as well. So it's a way of saving a little money that you're not going to get interest on. But you can solve a little money away for next spring. If, you, if you've got something coming up, <laughs> I'll guarantee you, you're not going to be able to touch it uh, until then. But uh, uh, thank you, Greg, for bringing that up. And I'll have a slide on this particular subject in the future. Uh, I hope that you all understand what I'm sh sharing with you because it is the singular place that most entrepreneurs will get in trouble with unreported income. Yeah, you deserve it, you want it, you need it, but you want to, but you don't want to pay uh, Social Security tax on it and, and all the other things that have to be paid. So what you do is you write yourself a check, you stub it as a, uh, uh, a consulting fee, and you start keeping up with that as a line item in your uh, in your book, bookkeeping and on your QuickBooks. And I really hope this helps you because it has really helped me as you go along the way. And thank you, Greg, for bringing that up. Another thing that might get you in trouble is not filing your taxes on time. And it's okay to get an extension. As a matter of fact, more and more people get them all the time. But the key is if you're getting an extension every year, time after time after time, that may run the flag up. If, however, your accountant is getting that extension for you, there's less likelihood of it. But some of us as entrepreneurs trying to do our own books and such as that, we run out of time, we have to get an extension and such as that. Got to be careful with that because I hear more and more people say that they really felt like they got all they did because they were doing extensions all the time. Uh, find out find out about your uh, uh, tax payments. It's important to file and pay those taxes on time. Always remember to consult a professional. Take what I said to you today as advice like we were sitting around the dinner table just chit-chatting. When it comes right down to your personal uh, security and your relationship with the IRS and your taxes, get professional uh, consideration. Uh, Greg and I are very happy to give you some tips and encouraging you to do this and that. But the bottom line is, is you and your CPA that's going to answer the auditors when it's time to come. So let's talk about this. Be the best person you can be. 
and you'll be the best business person you can be probably. I had an interview with a, a, a friend that's been to my classes for over 10 years today, today, this morning, came to my office and wanted to talk about uh, how he could improve his business situation. It's been going through a rough patch. And you know, it kind of all boiled down to, he had a cloud over his head as easy as he get depressed. Was we need to find inspiration in our lives. We have to let our batteries charge. All of us do. And uh, I've been doing it for 64 years, and I'll get down in the dump sometime. But now I know the I, I know the answer to help me get out of it is find inspiration, either in your faith or in your music. Uh, I do it with my Jesus, and uh, you do it with, with who it is that you find shining light from and the warmth to keep going. Maybe it's an event with a mentor or someone that will, you know, is going to give you good advice. I kind of felt like the fellow came to me today because we've had these sessions before and he left feeling better about his business. At tax time is the the reality check when we figure out whether we're making money or we're losing money. And we think about all the hours that we work and risks that we took for this purpose of uh, filling up that tax return and seeing that bottom line is a turning point every year for a lot of us. That turning point is, are we giving the right contributions at church and other places to feel good about why we're working? I mean, I'm not out here working just to buy groceries. I'm out here working and do, trying to do good to help the world be a better place and to feel better about myself and to help other folks uh, do better. Uh, are we, are we finding the time to charge our batteries? Are we getting good advice? Are we watching dumbass TV shows at night sometime? Or maybe you really need to improve and enhance some business skills by attending some webinars that Greg's sponsoring. There are a lot of things that we can do at these turning points in our life, recognizing when it's time to make a change, and that this is a good time to do it. So let me invite you all now, if you'd like to, turn on your uh, your mics and uh, have any questions that you might want to ask, and we'll try to do the best we can for you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to serve you. Steve, this is Sharon Shepard. Thank you so much for this um, experience, experience and enlightening um, opportunity. I missed two things that I just want to make a note of, and I want to ask you about it. First, I wanted to know, do the DOR under taxes stand for Department of Revenue? That's correct. North Carolina DOR, Department of Revenue. Okay. And when we were giving out the 25 business deductions, I missed number nine. And number 18. Well, I think we can just backtrack to them and see what it says. Medical expenses number 18. Okay, I put it together. I put medical expense and no, I got that 17. Okay. And I'll email you this entire list. And number nine was depreciation in general. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate the question. Steve, there was a question from uh, from Corey. Uh, is there an app you, you, you all use to track your mileage? Mm-hmm. There are apps out there to do that, and they're very sophisticated and very good. I personally don't have personal experience doing it, but I know some folks that do use it, and uh, it gives him a uh, week, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annual reports, and it's a, it's, it's a, I think, very inexpensive. So, yes, Corey, but I don't have the information to refer you to. Next. I know you got some questions. Um. I would like to say this. I have asked Steve if he would be available uh, for me to do some one-on-one um, consulting, not training, but consulting. But that involves you having questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
and uh, you have to have questions in order for consultation to work. So if any of you do have some questions, Steve is giving you his contact information, and uh, he, he knows how to set it up with me so that we can um, give you a couple of hours that uh, to your benefit. But you've got to have some questions. He can't just do a general presentation for you. Uh, that's what this is for. So if you have any questions about business, and they don't have to be about taxes, they don't have to be about record keeping, but when you want to talk about getting started in business and maintaining a business, he's the man. He's been doing it for, uh, I'm not even going to say how many years, Steve, unless you want to. <laughs> 64. 64 years. He, he's not no, talking about what he read in the book. He's talking about what he lives every day and has been living every day for a generation. Let's say that, Steve, okay? Yeah, and we got four phone calls coming in while we were doing this presentation. So I'm looking forward to uh, selling some more stuff this afternoon. I did put my email in. From, from any of my clients, uh, please let me know and, and go right ahead and, and do what you do. I'll do that. Mr. Hey, um, Corey, I've, I've got a quick question. I'm sorry. Sure, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay, yes, sir. so so Speak great job on. today. Thank you for all of the information. Um, and I think this might have been answered, but I wanted to be clear. Uh, there was a write-off, a deduction that said you could deduct up to $5,000 $5, in the year before the formation of your business. Is that correct? Yeah. That is correct. That's what it said on the internet page that I copied. That's right. Okay. So it would be fair to say that if if I had some type of certification or training that led up to the formation of my company, uh, and I did the training before, you know, maybe a month or two before my company was made legal with the Secretary of State, I could I could write that off and deduct that. That was the way I interpreted it as well, Corey, uh, and even any time during the previous year. And okay. you've got Thank right you so something, to Corey, that you may also want to. This is an opportunity for you to uh, to get a hold of a CPA to provide those basic setup services for your business, and those mm -hmm. services are tax deductible, and they could verify for you the other things that in general may be tax deductible, but individual businesses, you need to know for sure that your your tax situation allows it to be tax deductible to you. Was that clear? There, there, yeah, there that are was many, very clear. There are many general uh, tax deductible uh, items that might not apply to individual particular businesses because of their tax situation. Right. So once again, it's about questions, folks. It's not about answers. People can't answer. Can't give you answers to questions that you don't ask. This is Sharon. I have a question again. Um, is it fair to say, okay, so I went and got the LLC and the, I can't think of the other title that I got already. However, I didn't start the business yet, and it's been months already. So, how many months? I, I'm sorry, Greg. How many months? Oh, February, March, April, May, June, Wait, so May. The first year. The first year started um, February of this year, but. I haven't got the business up and um, launched yet, so um, my question would be, um, I need to contact IRS if I don't get going. I'm planning to get going in August, but if I don't get going before that time, I need to inform them that I did not um, generate any income and I haven't really got the business started yet. See, that's usually not necessary until it's time for your annual report, correct? Everybody making noise. That's correct. But, you know, I, I do, I'll, I'll say this, and I don't time to uh, take, steal your thunder, Steve. I get clients that come in here all the time, and they set up an LLC, or they set up a 501c3, and they don't do anything. Something happens. They get a snag. 
Some of them have gone for years. They've never done any reporting. They lose their certification. You will lose it if you don't file your annual report. Um, and so, that's basically all you have to do is file the report. Just file the report and tell them you didn't have any activity. You know. That, that well, report is due December 31st. I'm sorry, I was over talking you. I'm going to mute myself. To oh, I'm sorry. That report is due December 31st because I know he said that we have to have our taxes unless we ask for an extension. It's due December 31st. I know it's due annually, but I don't know the exact date. It's due, it's due April uh, 15th normally. Uh, the end of your fiscal year, if it is a calendar year, would be December 31st. It's, it's no different than uh, your personal taxes. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, as an LLC, you're probably going to be filing the Schedule C with your, uh, for the business in conjunction with your personal taxes, your 1040. But the, but the Schedule C is basically just, um, just a profit and loss. So mm -hmm. basically you're telling them whether or not you made any money. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. I have one other um, suggestion, only because I jumped the fire, went to some class, and they was like, oh, you got to get your LLC, like you said, in your 501C. Um, I would it be beneficial just to let those who are on this webinar to know that not necessarily do you need to run out and get that before you even got any business plans, I mean, before you're even ready to get started in your business. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, out of step. If, you, if you if you if you start a business before you I mean you start a business before you're ready to start it you're not doing anything but your mm -hmm. time is totally the IRS or the Secretary of State's office do not know that you're not operating they assume that you are operating when you file your articles you're telling them I'm in operation here's my board of directors information I'm in business. They don't. They don't know your daily activities. They wait for your annual report to tell them what you're doing. I, I you know, Sharon, do you have? Uh, are you uh, supported by any of the small business centers uh, uh, directors right now for consulting services? No. Where are you located? I'm in Kingston. <laughs> I'm with you, Eddie. Yeah, I, you and I have met. Uh, you, you sound familiar to me, but I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna tell her, call me, please. Okay, yeah, I will. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just call out my name. I saw that look. Steve. I saw that look. <laughs> 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 that, hey, that's that's a blessing. That's a good thing. Um, um, before you decide that you're gonna do the. Uh, LLC or the LMNOP, you know, call me. Please. Right. I did it already. You will remember who I am with the food truck. Yeah. Uh -uh. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. I, I have several clients in that predicament, and I get more and more every month, it seems like. They're coming in. They're filing for these um these forms of entity, which is basically creating your business, but they don't have a plan. They don't have any idea what they're supposed to do. Um, and they haven't done enough to get the business going. So please plan your business first. Talk to somebody from the small business center network, give Steve a call, uh, and, and work between, you know, uh, somebody who's actually doing business and somebody who's giving you, uh, Free consulting services. So that's right. Uh, let me say hello to Kevin. Kevin, do you have your mic on? Um, can you hear me? I hear you well. Are you in the electric business? I am. Yes. And coincidentally, I started my LLC back in November. Uh huh. I did not file any taxes. I did file with the Secretary of State the annual report but I really didn't start conducting business until January 1st, so I don't know if I should have filed for an extension with the IRS or 
That's a short business year. He's only one month in. Uh, yeah, I doubt there'll be any issues on that, Kevin. Where are you located? Um, Green Mountain, which is like right outside of Burnsville. Uh, absolutely. Well, thanks for joining us this afternoon. What type of electrical work are you doing? Um, I like to do new construction and um, service work is what I'm doing, residential. Uh -huh. Well, good. Well, I hope our presentation this afternoon may have, may have helped you, and uh, we'll, see you again, we'll see you again in the future. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. It was very informative. I appreciate and, it. And, I, and as I said, if you are in my coverage area, Lenore, Lenore Green or Jones Counties, or outside that area, and you have worked with me to be your business planning consultant, um, I'm willing to cover a couple of hours of one-on-one uh, -on -one consulting services with Steve. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, Kevin, you're outside my area. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so any other questions? All right. Send me the emails and, and uh, let's stay in touch. Uh, we'll, I hope to see you all through the summer and then again when we do our Academy Series in the fall. Uh, God bless you all and take care. Take care, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. God bless you. Call me, Sharon. I am.